Can you? Okay, well, we'll yeah, I'll just be conscious not to look at it, yeah. It's just because I looked at it directly, I'll not look at it. We want him to, to leave with his eyesight, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's like that. What do you think? Is it better on the footage? It's better. It's better okay. than us, well, the camera. We'll give it a go. I can always say I'm blind, turn it off, yeah. please. Yeah. Can't yeah. it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> sunglasses. <laughs> right. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm delighted that you're here. What I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to try and split this up into segments, the way I do this talk. Initially, I'm going to tell you about the world we live in, and we have to take quite an honest look at the situations, the circumstances that we see every day that we've actually become accustomed to and that we take for granted that are really quite insane. Once you start to meditate and you gain perspective and you become peaceful inside, you then start to gain clarity, focus and perspective because the external world, the frequencies of the external world and what you're emitting inside don't match anymore. And you start to see these things, you become aware, you have realizations. The second part, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you that the external world, everything that you experience on a daily basis, we create it. It comes from within. We're actually responsible for it. Once you realise this and the external world is maybe not quite as it should be, then what you start to do is we need to take a look inside. I, I quote in my book, I say, if something's broken and you want to fix it, first you need to take a look inside. If you're searching for happiness in the external world, you'll never find it. Bliss and joy is your natural state and it comes from within. Pleasure is derived externally. This might be television, shopping, Computer games, uh, drugs, alcohol, all of these things create temporary alleviation of the suffering of the mind. As human beings, and I'm going to prove this to you tonight, hopefully, you'll find that all the problems that we experience in life, as we go through our day, anger, frustration, anxiety, stress, which will be mind created, depression, Guilt, remorse, all of these things are mind created. We think when we get angry that something happens externally and that makes us angry. This is not so. What actually happens is something happens externally and you choose to become angry. So the source of all your problems is you. It's actually you. And I'm not pointing at any one person in particular. It's, it's me. It's, we create the stress and the suffering in this world. And then finally, um, if we've got time, what I'd like to do is I'm going to talk to you then in detail a bit more about meditation and correct thought and how if you, the second book I've written is called Moving Forward, Learn How to Glide. Now, my definition of gliding is elevating yourself and propelling yourself forward using the surrounding energies in harmony with zero resistance, with zero effort, um, in alignment with natural law. It is possible in this lifetime to undo the conditioning and programming that we've been given. We think that certain things we don't have a choice about. We do. You think that, for example, worry. You might think that when you worry, this is, it's a sign of affection. That when you worry about somebody, it shows you care. You have no choice about it. If you love somebody, you worry. This isn't so. This is just one example. When you worry about somebody, what actually happens? You have compassion, and then you have action, so you care about somebody, and then you do everything possible within your power to help them. The thoughts beyond that, then, is when you have negative thoughts about a situation, a future outcome that you can't control, and you give it to somebody else because you don't know what to do with it. That is what worry is. If you learn to manage this, you improve the lives of everybody around you, you improve your own health, you'll probably sleep better. You will not distance yourself from the people you're actually worried about, because if you're worried about somebody, quite often the stress that you pass on to that person, the frequency you have inside, you give to everybody you meet in your day. And this worry that you then pass to other people 
can even be a self-fulfilling prophecy. I know this because I rode my push bike. And when I rode my push bike, I used to ride it and I'm in bliss. It's, it's something I derive a lot of pleasure from. As I was doing this, the only time I've ever had an incident on my push bike, somebody spoke to me before and said, do you know what might happen if you crash that push bike? And they went into detail and listed all the things that could happen. Now, in detail, so I could have um, a brain injury, I might lose an arm, all the things in detail. Then when I went on my push bike, I wasn't fully present in the moment. I wasn't focused on the riding the bike. My reaction times were slow because all I was thinking about was all the things that could go wrong. In doing so, a car pulled out in front of me, but I wasn't as quick on the brakes, and I had an incident with the car. It's the only time it ever happened. So don't give anybody else the power to control your inner emotional state. And you need to be able to, when you meditate, and go into the silence and go into the gap, and learn how to become still, you gain contrast and perspective. The external world, the frequencies of the external world, you become peaceful and still, and you can see them for how they really are, you become aware. You also become aware then of other people, and the people that are able to press buttons. These people are able to control your inner emotional state to initiate responses within you. And you can learn to create a filter so that you can recognize these. And when you meditate on a regular basis, you then develop an inner peace, which is like a deep lake. And once you have inner peace, external events then are like ripples on the surface and they don't d disturb your, your inner emotional state. So the external world, then we'll look inside. And then finally, I'm going to give you a little bit of coaching with meditation if we have time. And hopefully we'll do one meditation at the end. Normally, if I was doing this, I would talk for eight hours. We'd split it up into four parts. And I'd go through what they call the preliminary meditations. And I'd take you through different stages of meditations and different techniques. As we go through these meditations, I'd then talk you through various stages of the mind and we'd finish up with a meditation at the end. So it's a condensed version tonight, but hopefully at the end we'll do a meditation as well. So excuse me, I'll sip water and then I'll start. I've got a cold, I've got a really dry mouth, so I'll have to apologise if I keep sipping. So, the external world. Imagine as a child, Imagine as a child that we're born into this world, and as we're born into this world, we're a perfect creation. We've got divinity within us, and we're still connected. You can call it the spirit realm, spirit realm, you can call it Gaia, the universe, the field, the unified field, God. You can call it what you like, but I believe as children are born into this world, we're still very spiritual beings, and we still have gifts that we lose as we're conditioned and programmed and we get older and we're putting more sugar and caffeine and toxins into our body and we are influenced by external events that create stress in our lives. We, we change as human beings. When a child is born into this world and it wants to climb a tree, it'll simply do this. It'll follow its heart and its dharma. It'll think of something. It'll not think of a hundred reasons why not to do it. It'll climb the tree. In doing so, because that child will be fully present and enjoying bliss, whilst it's doing that activity. It's a much greater, a lesser reduced chance of having an accident. I've done accident investigations and some very serious accidents on site when I was worked on site. And in every case, with the exception of somebody that isn't trained in the activity they're doing, in every case it's when somebody wasn't concentrating on what they're doing. Now you might say that those accidents occur that happen where the other person is responsible. That is so, so you can't control that, but it's because they're not concentrating on what they're doing. When you're fully present, if I pick this watch up and move it slowly like this, I'm not going to drop the watch. But when my mind is going at 100 miles an hour and I'm thinking about other things, then that's when accidents occur, when you're not concentrating and focused on what you're doing. As a child, you'll just climb a tree. You'll think, I'm going to climb a tree and you'll do it. As an adult, 
because of our conditioning and programming, we'll think of a hundred reasons why not to climb that tree. We'll think of a hundred things that can go wrong. And quite often, talk ourselves out of all action and actually do nothing because we'll convince ourselves that it's probably not a good idea to climb the tree. If you go through life like this, you'll end up, it's not living. It's not living at all. So the child, this pure being, hasn't discovered how to lie. It hasn't discovered doubt. Doubt hasn't been invented yet. They get that from us. They learn how to lie from us. The emotions that they witness and experience, that they repeat, the patterns they make, that they continue from the parents, never given with malice, only given with love, but those emotions, those feelings, those thought patterns, anger, frustration, they, what they do, they observe it, they witness it, they see us have these thought patterns, and they express these emotions, and they copy them. Now, anger, just one for example, there's a reason why when somebody's angry, they say, they're mad, or he's mad at me, he's mad at you. When you're angry, you are temporarily insane. When you're angry, you, when you're peaceful inside, you will not commit an act of violence. When you're peaceful if not inside, you will not do anything malicious. You will, when you're peaceful inside, you will not intentionally hurt another human being. Imagine if we all became peaceful inside and meditated, all violence would cease, it would, just, it would just stop. You can't hurt somebody when you're peaceful inside. It's when you have emotions like anger where you can't manage your thought patterns. When you have a reaction to an external event, at this point, you then, there's no filter and a raw emotion comes out and quite often you can speak to somebody when you're angry, you'll say something, and shortly after you'll think, oh, I wish I didn't say that, I didn't mean it. It's when you can't control the emotions because you've not got the discipline. And I say to a lot of people, say, is meditation easy? And I say, well, it's dead easy. And that means it requires discipline, effort, and dedication. It's, it's not going to happen without some effort. You've got to want change. You've got to want to improve your life. So then, as children, we go to school. When you go to school, we're given a compass to steer our way through life. Now, this compass, we navigate, and it's what's going to make us the most money, what other people think about us, what's going to get us the most stuff, and what's going to get us the best status, the position in society. Now, this is, again, not given with malice, but this is the system we are part of. Um, our children are born into this system. The two people on this planet that, in theory, have 100% that child's best interest at heart. The parents, at some point, usually have to let go of the leads, and, and this child goes to school. The teachers that teach this, I remember being at school, and never once did anybody say to me, um, do what you love. Never at once did anybody ever say to me, what makes you happy? There's actually, this is insane. On the syllabus, you go to school and you learn lots of things. But there is no, what I call, happy class. When you go to school, the most important job you have while you're alive in this realm, having this earthly experience in this space suit we call a body, is your happiness and your bliss. Now, this is not a selfish pursuit. Your happiness and your bliss, once you start to emit that frequency, when you're peaceful inside, when you're giving out love and compassion, when you're going around and helping everybody you meet, when you realize that the greatest feeling you can ever have is helping another human being, when you realize that in order to do that, you have to be peaceful inside. Remember what we're saying about if you're peaceful inside, all, all war would cease, because whatever you have inside, that's what you give to everybody else. So it's, it's actually your responsibility, not just optional. You need to get this right. We can do it in our lifetime. There's a couple of key factors in this. One is you have to, most people don't think that they have a choice. I'm here to tell you, you do. You don't have to get angry. I haven't got angry in years. I decided that I wasn't gonna get angry anymore. I'm not gonna give that power to somebody else. I do not feel good when I'm angry. I don't want anybody else to share that feeling. I don't want to give it to anybody else. Don't be confused. It doesn't mean you don't express yourself. 
Now to express, express, X as in former, was, you know, um, previous. And press as in pressure, so to express yourself is to remove pressure. You've got to get this out, right? Whatever's going on inside here, the feelings you have, the emotions you have, everything else, you need to express that. You need to, it can be writing, it can be singing, it can be talking to a friend, it can be dancing. Whatever you do, you need to find a way, find something, an avenue, a way of expressing yourself and giving this out. And it can be, you don't necessarily give it to other people, it can just be get taken out of the system to get it out. But if it's joyous, by God, give it to other people. Celebrate it, get it out. When we're at school, one of the problems is, so we don't have happy class. Children are not taught self-worth, to think positively, to have good mental health, and the compass is all wrong. The compass should be simply two things. What brings me joy and bliss? And then help other people. Experiencing joy and bliss is not a selfish pursuit. When you, if you're gonna help anybody else, you're gonna experience joy and bliss inside first. You're on the one job while you're on this planet. As we move through school, the children, they have what I call false idols. So they're role models on television and in magazines. By the way, this talk isn't all negative, but I have to, you have to take an honest look at the world first, and by the time I finish, you'll understand why I'm doing it this way. The children look in magazines and movies, and what they're seeing is Photoshop people. They're not real. These people pretend life's perfect, and although it's a wonderful experience, life can be quite tough at times. Uh, they pretend that they've no issues, and a lot of the people... I've had some very famous friends in the past, uh, actors, uh, pop stars, you know, and most of them have relationship problems, some of them are aggressive, some of them have a drug problem, some of them have an alcohol abuse problem. These people aren't perfect as portrayed in the media, this is not, it's not true, so these children are hardwired to fail before they even start, because they're trying to be people that don't even exist, they're not real. As you go through school, the children, this is when we start, right, I'm going to tell you how insane the world is now, you need to, this is the beat, you know, you, hopefully you'll see. If I went to a child and I said, there you go, there's a toy bag of heroin, come we'll play with that, right? You'd think I wanted locking up, yeah? We all, and I did too, um, children, we give them toy guns. Now, a gun has one purpose. A gun is a mechanical device, a machine invented by man to kill. That's it, to kill. A handgun, do you know what that's for? That's a mechanical device invented by man to kill another human being. We give these our children to play with, toy guns. I had them as a child. We've been conditioned to just see this as normal. It's okay, see, we don't really think about it, we're not. We've not got perspective, focus and clarity. These children are watching films on television, uh, G.I. Joe, or um, somebody I know said to me the other day, they said, I saw some children playing outside and we asked them what they were playing and they were going, tr -tr 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 -tr, expecting the answer to be, we're playing army. Do you know what the answer was? Total annihilation. That was that's what the children were playing. Where did they get that from? I am assuming it's from a computer game. I could be wrong, but they were playing Total Annihilation. <coughs> the way that our children are being conditioned now, we, the Dalai Lama, I think, said that if all seven-year-olds were taught to meditate within one generation, that all war would cease, and, and that's true. But they haven't got a cat and else chance if we don't condition them right, if we don't start to see. We need to be the generation now that is the first one that can recognise when you gain perspective through meditation, you can see the programming. Not just be part of it, immerse in it, but stand back and have a look, question everything. I knew tonight when I was coming to New Horizons that this would be, I was in the right place because there's not one person here that isn't here. If you come to New Horizons, it's because you're questioning things, because you're asking the right questions, you know, because you're starting to see, maybe just see things a little bit differently than the masses. So I'm in the right place, hopefully. So the children come to school and uh, 
in the late teens, they're doing exams, early teens, they're doing exams, and I've seen, I've actually seen seven and eight year olds crying or stressed because of exams. This is not right. And what we do, we try and put everybody in a box. So we, some, a, children, a child does a test, and then from that result, we decide which box they go in, or the intelligent, which maths group they go in, what, what we do with them. The fact is, we are unlimited beings with unlimited potential. We're spiritual beings having a human experience, which you've probably heard before. When we start to define ourselves, when we start to give ourselves edges, when we start to put ourselves in a box, we give ourselves limitations. We're reducing what we can do. We're unlimited beings. We have unlimited potential and we've forgotten this. We've forgotten. So the children get to school and young men in particular, I think, are particularly vulnerable because they have, from my experience being at school, young men are, if you say, express your emotion, you decide you've got to write poetry, you want to play guitar and stuff, it's dope, it's a soft zone. And if you show weakness, it's considered um, already feminine aspects. When I was at school, that would have been, um, I would have got called for that, you know. And we're brought up to be macho, and young men do express themselves, and this is where a lot of problems start in our society. In my view, women are far closer to God, right? <laughs> it's that simple, because women generally express their emotions more than men do. Men suppress them, and then it means when they get to the late teens, they become angry, which you'll find out about my journey shortly and how that affected me, because I was violent. Um, I don't just mean now and again, I mean I was violent. And I'll get to that. So young men don't express themselves, and then they leave school. And they're angry, and they don't know what to do with this. And then comes war. Now, a human being has never been further away from his true nature, from his inner voice, to when he's killing another human being. Now, this isn't criticism of people in our forces who go to war because they're doing it for the correct motivations. They think they're protecting the nation and protecting the family. The fact is they're probably going to another country for oil. They just don't know the big picture. But they're not doing it for the wrong motivations. They're not joining the army because they want to kill. They're doing it because they believe they're protecting the families. It still strikes me as insane that as a young man, you could be 15 years old and you could join sign up to the army and learn how to kill another human being. But you can't buy a pack of cigarettes. You can't drive a car and you can't make love. Please somebody explain that to me. That's insane. These young men, when was the last time you ever saw a 70 year old suicide bomb? You won't see one. They don't exist. If you try it, it's young men because they're very easily influenced. They've got this raw emotion inside and they're easily manipulated. What you'll find is that if you know, they say they, they cap the age limit for people joining the army. And this is apparently because of fitness, but in reality, I've done the Ironman. The average Ironman, the average age of Ironman is 52 years old. So it's not necessarily because they're fitter, because they're younger. What it is, is when you're in the age of 40, you wise up a little bit. And if somebody says, will you join the army? Go over there and get some oil for me. I'd risk your life, you'd go, not on your belly, right? You just wouldn't do it. Young lads, very different. They have this sense of pride, national pride and ego. The thing is as well, which I'll get to, my ego used to be massive as a young man, you're showing how tough you are, and that's, that doesn't help either, but that's, it's still instilled in schools because of the, the sports and the recreations that boys do and girls do. The walls are coming down slowly, but not nearly quick enough. And a conversation I have quite a lot with, I had it the other day in a session I was doing with about my sexuality. Now, I know what my sexuality is. My partner knows what my sexuality is. But if somebody asks me what my sexuality is, it very rarely happens, but it has happened a few times because I think because I now will express myself because I will show emotion, because I'm not proud of being feminine, because I hug and kiss men and women. I don't mean snog them, I just mean kiss them on the cheek. Um, but they get not, some of the toughest men I've met, some serious gangsters that I've hooked around with, when you meet them, you kiss each other on the cheek, you know. So. But 
because of those things, somebody would then say, well, you know, ask me to express my sexuality. It should have nothing to do with anything, right? It's the tenth question you ask, if it's even important, it's right there on the list. Your sexuality shouldn't matter. It should be the actions, what you do in the outside world, you know, the, the good deeds you do, the things, if you help people, your sexuality doesn't matter. What, what, sex, what sexuality that somebody is, is, is not that important. It really isn't. So, so I'll tell you a little bit about my story. That section alone, I could go on for hours, but um, you sort of get the idea. Um, again, the USS Nimitz is uh, it's a warship they built in America, and it's nine billion pounds to build one, and the US Navy builds several every year. Just from that one aspect alone, uh, we could end world hunger like, like that. We could end world hunger. When we build a new warship, and just listen to that name, it's a warship, right? It's 100,000 tons of metal to design to kill other human beings en masse, carrying rockets, missiles, helicopters, fighter jets. Somebody tell me, this is, this is insane. We're the only sentient beings on this planet that go around and kill each other en masse. In fact, the human race kill everything we come into contact with. We kill each other, we kill the planet kill animals and all life on this planet. When they have a warship in Portsmouth, a new warship has just been built, and it sets sail, and it'll come out of the harbour and it'll go across. You will see children with flags, you know, uh, Union Jacks waving them as this warship comes past, and we celebrate it. There's nothing to celebrate about a warship, honestly. There's not. It's a sign of insanity within our, our nation, you know. So, so that's a little look at the outside world. You know, the A team shooting machine at three o'clock in the afternoon, but God forbid you see a vagina. God forbid you see a vagina on television. You know, it's it's become normal to see our kids. And look, I, I remember I'd go around my mates for tea. We're going at like about half four, and the A team would fire a machine gun. Tell her, yeah, it's normal, no, no problem. But the naked bodies is an issue. Um, We've, we've, we've gone way off path, we're out of kilter, we're out of alignment, we've, we've lost our way, we really have, and we've become conditioned to not even notice it. I'm asking you to notice it, and I'm telling you when you learn to meditate on a regular basis, you will start to see this everywhere. You don't dwell on it, but we need to look at it, we need to be aware of it, and then we know what we're going to do about it. You can't deal with the problem until you accept there is one first, that's a, you know, a common Statement. So my life, I was, when I was very young, uh, I lived in Africa for a few years, and then I came back to the UK, I lived in, I think by the age of 15, I lived in 15 houses, I'd been to eight or nine schools, we moved around a lot, and I was conditioned, I've all, I've, Big family of Irish men. Uh, I think there's seven Patricks. On Christmas Day, there's Paddy, Pat, PJ, PJ Junior, Pat, and we just called one Patrick Francis, just because we ran out of Patricks. So it was a, it was a challenge. But within that, although there's a lot of love and wonderful people, we were brought to think that tough was the way you judge the man's character. Now, for me, I now admire a man that causes little disturbance, that's meek, that's gentle. A man that doesn't need to tell everybody how good he is. When you, you're just going through life helping people, that's all, that's all you want to do. I admire a quiet, meek man now. Not some, you know, like a lot of my friends who adore me and well, like I used to be, but. So my family was brought up and I remember being at a family do when I beat somebody up and everybody brought me a pound. It was like you got a pat on the back, you know, so it was, we were brought up that way. My, my granddad was very notorious, he was famous throughout the north of England for being a fighter, a tough family. And I discovered, I think when I got to the age of about 
15 or 16, I'd been beat up a few times, and then I discovered it hurt a lot less if I beat somebody else up. And this became quite normal. And I started, I think, in Bolton Town Centre. I, I don't know, it's in the hundreds, but well over a hundred fights. It could be a lot more than that. Every weekend, I'd, I'd beat somebody up. And I wouldn't need much of a reason. There'd always be a reason. I, never, I always said I never started a fight. Right? But what I would do is, somebody might, I'd climb over a petrol station forecourt and beat somebody up because they didn't say thank you. You see, I'd, I'd justify it. I was desperately unhappy. I went into a career that I was guided into because of monetary gain, not never to do with what made me feel good, what I enjoyed. And consequently, I was I was miserable. I was I was miserable. And this went on, and I I was a highly intelligent child. Now it's a difficult one because if you say you're not highly intelligent and you are, you lie. If you say, yeah, you sound like a bit of a div, so it's difficult. But I was a highly intelligent child. I took, like, my O levels early, I took GCSEs early, I took some A levels early. I took them before I reached that age. Um, I was highly intelligent. And I started experimenting with drugs very young. So I was probably about 14 when I started, uh, just with cannabis initially. But it soon went into LSD, amphetamine, ecstasy, and then it just went on. And I think in the book I list, I've taken... I can't remember exactly, but it's well over 30 drugs, and that's not including steroids, and obviously not including plant medicines, because that's a whole different thing. But I've taken a lot of drugs. And I did a talk not long ago, and the reason my story is relevant is because what I'm going to show you is transformation, growth. If life's always been perfect, and you're floating around on a cloud, well, that's great, but people aren't going to relate to that. Maybe people, maybe yogis are, and people that meditate. If your life's not going so well, and you're struggling, if I can show people that my life was far worse than theirs was, it's a, it was a mess, my life, and then I can show them that I've changed, that I've evolved and grown, and that I did it initially with meditation, and I can show people this, then they'll realise that Everybody can do it. If I can do it, anybody can do it. It's not just, you know, there's not just a, a, a chosen few that can learn how to do this. It's there for all of us. You've just got to decide if it's what you want. You know, do you want peace? I'll say in the book, all anybody want, ever wants is peace, even if they don't know it yet. I now deliberately avoid drama in my life. I like everything nice and quiet and running smooth. It doesn't always go that way, but I've learned to move away from certain things, navigate around others, and if something, for example, if you have a piece of wood like this, and you push against it, yeah, and you have resistance, you hold it in place, take away the resistance, and the wood will fall away. What you need to try and do is take the resistance out of the system, the resistance out of your life. In your life, you'll experience resistance all the time, resistance, and opposition. But for there to be conflict, there has to be two sides. You can simply not be one of those sides. There are certain things that you have to deal with, but you can deal with them in a different way. When you meditate, if I have a problem, I've gone into meditation, sometimes for hours, but uh, it depends. I come out of the meditation, and one of several things has happened. When you become still, go into the gap, The external world keeps moving. The external world is transient. Everything in this universe vibrates. When you become still, when you come out of the meditation, either the problem's changed, the problem's completely gone, or you, you have a solution. You'll find that when you quiet the mind, you have razor sharp focus and clarity. Things that elude you, problems that have been there for a long time, when you learn how to press the reset button, not with drugs like I did, but through meditation, you'll find that the, you are, you, you're only fulfilling a fraction of your potential as a human being. Right? I mean a fraction, I don't, I don't mean 10%, I mean a fraction. Um, you, you can do amazing things, you just don't know it yet. You need reminding, you need reminding that as human beings our capacity to manifest and create and change this world, it's, it's immense, it's immense. 
So I took a lot of drugs and I did a talk with some young men there and what I had to do to make this work, I, what I do is association. I need to show growth. If I'm always floating around on the cloud, they won't relate to me. So I said, how much cocaine have you taken this year? Right, so they totted it up. And it was, yeah, it was, it was quite a bit. Um, I'd taken, and then I said I'd taken that in one night. And then they started to listen because they could resonate with me because they thought, who's this guy I want to see now? But once I can show a common chord, so if somebody's been depressed, I've been depre depressed. If somebody's had suicidal thoughts, I've had those too. If somebody's got a drug or alcohol problem, I've been to the rock bottom. I've, I've been right to the bottom with those things. If somebody's suffered from anxiety, I've done that too. A lot of the things, probably not, maybe not all of them, but I've, I've experienced a lot in my lifetime. Um, and people start to resonate with that, so it's really important to show the, the negative side first as well, so they can see the change, the growth, the transformation. So I took a lot of drugs, very unhappy. And then, excuse me. What I did, what we tend to do as human beings, we think the external world is responsible for how we feel inside. And that we're victims and we're being thrashed around like a boat at sea with no sail, with the rudder broken, and you're just getting tossed around. And that's how it can feel sometimes. But that's because we've, we've forgotten what we're capable of. I took a lot of drugs for many years and I was violent. And I had six years ago what you might call a nervous breakdown. So you can call it a nervous breakdown, the shift, a spiritual awakening, a midlife crisis, the menopause, although I haven't had the menopause. But you can call it any number of things. The point is a lot of people, when they get to an age, specifically, some people figure it out early on. If you're one of the lucky ones, what will happen is you'll realise that you're way out of alignment and you gradually pull yourself back. I didn't. I was on a treadmill and I got thrown off it at full speed. And only then did I know I was on the treadmill because I had perspective, because I'd become still. Only when you gain perspective, I could look back and I thought, my God, what have I been doing for the last 20 years? 20 years had just disappeared. I'd gone from being a spiritual person, got to my late teens, lost my way. 20 years later, I've been on drugs for 20 years, I've been violent, I've been drinking, I've been angry. And I look back, I thought, I'd, I'd, I'd lost touch with my true nature, I didn't even know who I was. And so I had to make some fundamental changes. And at first it's quite scary. Quite often in life, the, some of the worst things that happen to you at the time seem like the end of the world. When you look back with perspective, they're the catalyst for a spiritual awakening. They're a catalyst for a change of direction. They're a new beginning. They are the best thing that ever happened to you, but you just don't see it at the time. There's a reason when I write, I'm called Midnight. And Midnight is the start of a new day, the dawn of a new day. It's when the darkest point of the night starts moving back towards the light. Midnight is a new beginning. And it's transformational. And I'd like to think that through the writings and teachings and the classes I do and speaking that I'm trying to impart some of that wisdom. And it doesn't mean I think I know it all. I realise they say a wise man, somebody who thinks he knows everything, knows very little or nothing. Somebody who realises how little they know might know something. And I'm very aware that I don't know everything, but I've changed my life in uh, slight years away from you where it used to be. So I had to make some fund fundamental changes in my life. And what I did, first of all, I couldn't go outside, right? For a long time, I, I became very introvert. I couldn't go outside. I had become so far out of alignment with, if your external actions in the external world, the way you behave, 
is way out of alignment from the way you feel inside and this continue, you will come to a point and the system won't fail, you'll break and that's what happened to me, I couldn't continue anymore. We think that the external world is responsible for how we feel but it's not. I can give you some examples, you have two men stood on top of a cliff and one is looking at the view, rolling in ecstasy and I can see the clouds the sun coming through the clouds, the hilltops, snow coming up. It's a beautiful view. The other is on his hands and knees, holding onto the grass, terrified in hell because he's scared of hives. Now, if this, if, sorry, it's the same environment, it's the same circumstances, it's the same conditions. The difference is the thought process. The thoughts that person has about an external event, not the external event. I can give you more examples. You can have a football match and a ball goes in a goal and this lot of people jump up on this one side and then the ball goes in the other goal and the rivers. Now, it's a ball going between some metal poles, right? But depending on your opinion or your viewpoint will determine whether you experience heaven or hell. I can give you an even better example. Sound. If you hear a beautiful piece of music, but then the day after you have a hangover, and somebody puts that music on. It's like somebody dragging the nails across a chalkboard. It can be horrendous. Now, the music's not changed. It's your interpretation of that external event. If somebody plays you a piece of music when you're 20, I boom, 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 you think, yeah, right? Put your cap on backwards, whistle, and you're off. 40 years later, that's not even music. Now, the music's not changed. You've got older, and you probably slower. If somebody plays you a piece of music, a beautiful piece of classical music, and you're peaceful inside, and you hear this music, and you derive this and joy from this piece of music, then another time you're highly agitated or angry, and this music's played you, and it can, it can be upsetting, it can be, you won't derive any pleasure from it, and you'll just want to turn it off. The music's not changed, your inner emotional state has changed. My life has changed. The external world hasn't changed. Nothing's changed in the external world. I've gone from being in a hell, taking drugs to switch my mind off because I didn't know a better way at the time, to experience joy and bliss on a daily basis. And you know what's changed? Me. It's me. It's the way I think. It's the way I feel. It's because you've become peaceful inside. When you become peaceful, you've got contrast. You can actually start to examine your own thought processes and negative patterns that you've developed as human beings. For every positive thought we have, we'll have 10 or 12 negative ones. Now, there is a skill and an art to this, and you can learn how to recognize the negative ones because you've got perspective. You don't have to have an angry thought. I think, I'm angry. You can learn to recognize it as an angry thought, and you don't have to pick it up. Just like a conveyor belt with thoughts going past on the conveyor belt, you can start to recognize what makes you feel good. And you can learn to pick the good ones up and not pick the, I nearly swore, but the ones you don't want to pick up. This, you can call this in Buddhist, Buddhism, it's probably if I did a workshop, it would be the third meditation we do, and it'd be what I call observation, but you can call it mindfulness. These are all techniques and skills. The idea of learning how to meditate is to, I'm not trying to, I don't teach Buddhism by the way, I teach meditation, it's important to understand this. When I say Buddhism, there's a Buddhist center in Bolton and it's a wonderful place and I've been many times. But the people, generally, it's not very busy. And I've had meditation classes in Bolton with 60 people in. The reason is because People associate Buddhism, until you know a little bit about it, you think it's a cult, and they think the babies are something. What actually happens is, so I disassociate the two. You don't have to be a Buddhist to meditate. I'm teaching meditation. That's what I teach. If you learn to meditate, you can learn to reduce stress and develop inner peace and experience joy and bliss. It's that simple. We're not saying you have to become enlightened. You don't have to become a Buddhist alpha. You don't have to know all the manifestations and the um, different types of Buddha or anything like that. You can just learn some really basic, simple skills to reduce your stress, manage your stress. Once you become peaceful inside, which I'll talk about shortly, but 
you'll see meditation when you become peaceful this will pervade into every single aspect of your life when I do a workshop people meditate uh, hopefully for 14 days and when they do this the life changes and after that point nobody I never have to tell that person to meditate again they do it right because it's become part of the life and they realize that once you get to that point you 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 would never give it up because of, because of the changes you'll see in your life, you know. So I had a nervous breakdown, and from this, I then became introvert, and I realised I had to make some changes. This is when I learned to meditate. I've been aware of meditation for some time, and I went to, there's a Buddhist centre I went to in the lakes, and it's called Manjushri. Now, you don't have to go to a Buddhist centre, that's where I went to learn to meditate. And I went, a very, a very clever thing happened when you go on a retreat, you see. To retreat yourself, to go on a retreat, you need really, for it to be effective, you need to remove yourself from your everyday environment, right? Because if you're in your home and you think, I'm having a couple of days to myself, your phone will ring. Somebody will knock at the door. You'll have, if you try and meditate, there'll be things on the wall, you'll look down and think, oh, I must clean that carpet. There's, your everyday environment has triggers in it and emotional attachments and it'll trigger thought patterns. So to really, to retreat, you need to retreat from your everyday life. You need to remove yourself from your everyday environment. When I did this, I discovered a few things. And one of the first things I discovered was that after two days I'd been there and I thought, my job's crap, my relationship isn't working, uh, the people around me, I had all these the list of things that were causing my problems. And then I realised after a couple of days there, actually, None of these things are actually here in the minute. Oh no, it's me. I'm the problem. And you have I had an epiphany. Um, and I realised that it was none of these things. It was my interpretation of them. And I was the source of all my problems. And this is a big step, you know, to realise this. I also I Buddhism for me, I won't dwell on Buddhism, I'll talk about it for another couple of minutes because I'm conscious, I don't want this talk to be about Buddhism, although it's part of my life, it doesn't have to be a part of yours. If I was to have world peace, everybody's got to be invited. If I say, I'm right, and you're wrong, I'm building walls, I'm creating barriers. I'm making a secular society. So in order to have world peace, everybody's got to be invited. In Buddhism, all religions are welcome. So if you go to a Buddhist temple, you'll see Sikhs, Hindus, Muslims, Jewish people, Christians, all faiths. What they're saying is, everybody, we show compassion to everybody, and you're allowed to have your own opinions and views. You don't have to agree with me, right? The one thing we do agree on is peace, love and compassion. In Buddhism, men and women are treated equally. Manjushri, um, nearly all the the big bosses, uh, they're all women. All the men, nuns, uh, they're all uh, who are in charge are predominantly women. So men and women are treated equally. Your sexuality is irrelevant in a Buddhist temple or in a Buddhist community. It doesn't matter. If you want to question things, I was a lot of a Catholic. If I questioned a priest, I got in trouble. And if I did that again, headmaster. And I did it all the time, because uh, I was a clever dick. So I was totally highly intelligent, so I challenged authority at every opportunity. Um, and it didn't go down well. But yeah, if I question the priest, I got in trouble. In, in Buddhism, the divine debate, how can you not have it? If, if I'm trying to say, this is a good way to do things, and you know maybe you should have a, have a look at this, but then not in, invite debate, the reason that they were uncomfortable with my questions is because the system was flawed. Uh, just, just one aspect is the fact, and I don't wish to offend anybody because everybody has the right 
to uh, have their own beliefs and I'd strongly believe that as long as you're not harming other human beings. But when all the money's in the Vatican and there's lots of people who don't have food, that's just way off. It's way off, right? It doesn't mean I don't have respect for a lot of priests and are wonderful people. It doesn't mean I don't have respect for Christians and Catholics. What I'm saying is they have no food and they have loads of money, right? That's, that's what I'm saying. So... So if it's okay with you there, we're going to have the break there because I think it's a good point to have the break. I'm trying to do this so that it, it works for everybody and I think I'm within three minutes so I'm doing okay. That's good timing, yeah. Uh, Shalom, thanks for listening and we'll start again shortly. Thank you. Hello everybody. Right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to manage the time, and it's 25 past nine. What I'd like to do, if everybody's okay, I'm going to finish at half ten, or maybe maybe quarter past ten, and then it just gives a bit of time to we do the questions at the end. Is that right? Got the format right? Yeah. So about quarter past ten, so it gives me about 45, 50 minutes. So in that time, uh, I'm going to talk a bit more, and then I'm going to tell you about meditation, how it works, and we're going to meditate. And if you haven't done it before, um, this is a good time to learn. Uh, you've only ever got the present moment. You've only ever got now. The present moment exists. It's this perfect perpetual moment. And if I said to you, give me a piece of yesterday, you can't. If somebody says, give me a slice of tomorrow, you can't. You've only ever got now, this moment. So what you do in this moment changes the course of the universe, changes the course, no pressure, right? Every decision you make right now is changing your life and the destiny of the human race. A successful life is simply this, it's one good decision followed by another. That's all it is, one good decision in this moment. What's gone before, it's history, it doesn't exist anymore. You can't change it. By all means, we can learn from it and use it to help us guide and make decisions. But you gotta cut that shit loose, right? Don't dwell on the past, it will drag you down. It's like being a ship in a port, ready to set sail and not cutting the ropes loose. You can never leave the port. We, we're limited beings, we're meant to, life's meant to be adventurous, it's meant to be joyous and blissful and we're supposed to set sail and experience new things. This is why you regularly need to transcend fear. And I don't mean accidentally and occasionally. I mean every single week, intentionally, directly, address fear. If there is something in your life that you'd like to do that possibly you've not done or possibly you taught yourself out of and you think, what if I look silly? What will people think? What if it doesn't work? You'll never know if you don't try it. Once you transcend fear, this is a massive part of having a joyful life. If I go back, say, two years ago, I couldn't sit in front of people. I had terrible anxiety. Yeah, I told you that, you know, three or four years ago, I didn't go outside for a long time and somebody had to go and do my shopping for me. Uh, I couldn't go outside. And I couldn't face people. A lot of people thought that maybe I was being rude Oh, I was ignoring them because I cut my social circles completely. I bar probably about five people. Um, I went through my phone and there were 750 numbers and 730 of them were drug related. There were people that I either sold drugs to, bought drugs from me, um, or friends that I just used to be partying. But they were all, all drug related. So I needed to sort of make some fundamental changes to my life. So you need to regularly transcend fear now to do this. When you go against your programming, it can be uncomfortable at first. I think it's Sadhguru who says that in order to reach a comfortable altitude, you will first experience turbulence, right? You're gonna to have to go through this, uh, this process. If I'm frightened of doing something, and it can be very small, a great sculpture starts with 
just tiny tips, right, small steps. If I'm fine to doing something and I then do it, it feels uncomfortable at first. And it can be something very small. It can be something like talking to somebody on the bus that maybe you've seen many times before and you've always wanted to say hello, but you, you're not that kind of a confident person. So you say hello to them. You transcend fear a little bit. You feel a bit uncomfortable, uncomfortable, self-conscious, a bit nervous. And once you've done it, you think, you know, actually that wasn't that bad. And quite often, the secondary process, as with frustration, I say in the book, frustration is uh, like lighting a match and shouting fire. Frustration, the thought process, is usually far worse than the initial problem itself. And it's created, you create it. I've seen somebody stub the toe in Asda and going, oh, you fucking... But I'm, t I'm thinking, there's nobody else there. There's just somebody stood on the road going mad at themselves. This is insanity. Frustration is insanity. It's not that I don't make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. I make less mistakes possibly because I'm peaceful and I make better decisions, but I still make lots of mistakes. But when I make a mistake now, it's simply this. I make a decision, I choose a course of action. A result comes from that course of action. I then have a look at it and think, is, is that a good result, is it not? If it's not, I learn from it and next time I make a better decision. There is no frustration involved. Right. Frustration is optional, it's not compulsory. You do not have to get mad with yourself. There's plenty of other people that will do that for you. So, let's talk about being fully present. To bring your attention into this moment, what happens, we've talked about before, is that your actions can be way out of alignment with how you feel inside your true nature, your true essence. Not your ego, not the person everybody thinks you are, not the person you pretend to be, because that requires a lot of effort. For years I was pretending to be somebody that I wasn't. It was tiring, really tiring. To become fully present, there are many many ways of doing this. And what you want to do is you bring your attention into this, in this moment, there's only this moment, this perfect rolling perpetual moment. Imagine it like this, being fully present. Imagine a mountain and you're sat on top of this mountain and on top of this mountain is a her. And you're sat on top of the her, right? That's this present moment. It's, it's the, it's now, it's always now. If somebody asks you, when did this happen? You say, oh, that happened yesterday. But if they ask you while you're doing it, when, when did this happen? It, well, it's now. When are you talking? I'm talking now. When, when are you doing this? I'm doing it now. Everything you've ever done is done in the present moment. It may be a past present moment. It may have gone. But everything you've ever done is done in the present moment. We are the only beings on this planet that aren't fully present. All animals, all nature is fully present. If you imagine, if you're in a room with a hundred people and they're all laughing, and you're in this room for any period of time, I guarantee you, you'll start to laugh, right? Because when you're submersed, immersed in an energy, a surrounding energy, it will affect you. Yeah, until you're an enlightened being, in theory for an enlightened being, I can sit in the middle of the M62, meditate, nothing will bother me. we're not. So your environment's going to affect you. If you sit in a room with 100 people and they're laughing, you'll start to laugh. If you sit in a room with 100 people, or oh, a war zone, and somebody gets maimed, loses a limb, now you don't necessarily get injured yourself, you just witness this you will be mentally scarred, probably. You'll carry this with you. This, so your environment affects you. So if you immerse yourself in a perfect system, if you spend time in nature or with animals, it can be horses, dogs, whatever, they don't carry around. They're not traveling through the present moment thinking about all the things that happened that were terrible yesterday that they can't do anything about. They're usually not anticipating things that haven't happened yet, a future event that you can't control. 
what you do if you remember compassion, action, and then the thought beyond that is negative. You have compassion for somebody, you help them, and then the worry is basically all the negative thoughts you have about a future event that you can't control. If you immerse yourself in a system like nature on a regular basis, they call it, uh, I believe the Japanese don't call it forest bathing, this system works in harmony within natural law. What will happen is you will feel peace. Remember, 100 happy people, you'll start to laugh. I've done it, I've done laughter yoga, right? If you've ever done laughter yoga in a group of people, you'll start the laughter and it's forced initially, and then you'll get one person that's got a silly laugh. And then everybody starts laughing. We did it, and I did a festival where I spoke, and there was 10 people and we started laughing. By the time we'd finished, there was about 80, 90 people, a field full of people. Everybody fell off the chairs. It was just brilliant. We even started really getting out of our comfort zone. I had to pretend to be a squirrel and laugh. Uh, <laughs> how do you do it? I don't know how you do it. I was outside my comfort zone. I felt ridiculous, but it was brilliant. So if you regularly immerse yourself in nature, in a system that's operating in harmony with natural law, where everything in that system is fully present, a perfect system, you will feel peace. Meditation is not the only way. A lot of us are going through life and we're spending a lot of energy. You can learn how to glide. Imagine you're swimming upstream, you're spending a lot of energy and you're getting absolutely nowhere. Right? You're swimming on the spot almost because you have resistance in your life, because you are wrestling everything that comes into your life. It's not exactly how you want it. You've not accepted it. You're trying to control it. You're trying to put it in a box. You have resistance. When you do this, everything's hard work. Imagine if you could learn to turn, turn around and you're going downstream and you're going at 100 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, sculling like this, spending no energy whatsoever because you're in alignment with your dharma. You're moving within natural law. This comes from following your heart. So remember what I said about transcending fear. When you transcend fear, the first time you're uncomfortable, you're going against your conditioning and your programming. Your conditioning and program, your conditioning and program is your ten negative thoughts saying, "Don't do that. You might look ridiculous. Don't do that. You might fail." You'll do it. You'll realise that it's never nearly as bad as you think. And you'll think, that wasn't so bad. And what will happen is, you'll feel good, right? Because you've just done something that you've gone against your programming. And it feels good because you've achieved something, because you've conquered a small amount of fear. Then what you do is you just keep doing this on a regular basis and maybe increase, you know, up the ante a little bit. So you move into fear on a regular basis. I started when I was speaking a terrible anxiety. And I did classes. I've been winging it for the last two years. I, I, my, my, I, my face in the universe. I never really know quite how things are going to work out, but I follow my heart and my dharma. And that means quite often transcending fear and going against your conditioning and your programming. So I was anxious when I started speaking. And I was, I mean, really bad. I had the shakes, I was sweating, I was uncomfortable. Now I'm sat in front of you all and I'm pretty comfortable, right? You know, I've, I've I've evolved, I've grown as a human being because I transcended fear, because I followed my dharma. We all have to do this, we've all got a song inside. I'm going to read you a poem at this point, I hope that that's okay. It's a poem in my book and it's the first poem I wrote in a very long time, a very long time. Um, and it felt great. I found a medium. I learned how to express myself uh, through writing. Who knew? You know, one of the things I wasn't very good at when I was young was English. I was terrible at it. Um, I was gifted in maths and physics and computers and um, logical things, um, but I wasn't very good at writing. And then I started to write a couple of years ago, and my life changed because I found out I could, I could express myself. You need to get this out. Remember what I said? I said, if you have, um, if you don't feel good inside and you don't get this out, 
it's toxic, it will manifest, yes, and you will become ill. I think it's Wayne Dyer says that it's, uh, nobody's ever died from a snake bite. It's the venom. It's what stays behind afterwards. If you don't get the way you're thinking about the past and your negative thoughts and emotions outside, and you let it fester inside, it'll kill you. Slowly, but it'll kill you. So we need to learn to express ourselves. So I'm gonna read you this point. It's called The Answer. Hopefully it'll explain to you that if you don't know it yet, maybe if at some point in the future you come on one of my workshops, by the time you finish, you'll realize you can do anything. Because if somebody said to me, if I could just think back, I was tied up in a hotel room, being tortured with a gun to my head, and somebody said, you're gonna write a book. If I was been on a drug binge for three days and somebody said, you're gonna be a, a radio presenter. If when I was very depressed and perhaps suicidal and somebody said to me, you're going to teach meditation. I've gone from there to there by changing this with learning a degree of inner mastery. It all starts, you have to meditate first and become peaceful only at this point when you clear your mind. At this point, you then have perspective. You then have focus and clarity. And you can start to see your life as it really is. You can start to almost see yourself in a third person. You can step back and look at yourself and see, you no, know, they say yeah, you can't see the wood for the trees. You know, you can actually take an honest look at your life and see what it's like. This comes through meditation. So the answer. The answers you were looking for were here all along. They're inside your heart in the form of a song. The lyrics are heavenly, about peace and love, the rhythm divine and sent from above. No war, no conflict, no hunger, just peace. This is the way how all suffering will cease. You see, love is the answer to every question they pose. It was there all along, right in front of their nose. You need to have courage to dance to the beat, to laugh and spread joy moving your feet. You see, actions and words, what you do every day, the message you send and the music you play. It's this that will decide the fate of man, so you must act now and do all that you can. What you do here, you give out to all. This is the time, and it is your call. So now you have the answer, what will you do? It's time to decide, and it's all up to you. You see the treasure inside from God whence it came. So it's your turn now, you must do the same. Go into the world and spread the word. It's your time to shine and you must be heard. Like a radiant star shone into the night, changing the world with your beam so bright. The light from within is the answer we needed. Now you have shown it, let's hope it's heeded. If you can live in harmony without any drama, then my friend, you have followed your dharma. So, what's your dharma? Your dharma is your, your inner voice, your true self. It's, it's your guidance system, it's what makes you feel good, it's following your heart, it's what comes from within. If you start to meditate on a regular basis, you go into the silence, into the gap between thoughts, you become still. I've spent many months doing this over the years, I've, I've I've spent weeks and weeks and weeks meditating. It was a journey for me. Blaise Pascal says, all man's problems stem from his inability to sit quietly in a room on his own. When you meditate, there's nowhere to hide. You've got to deal with this, what's going on. Remember what I said about transcending for you. Uh, quite often our greatest enemy is our own mind. You need to learn how to be comfortable with yourself learn how to sit in silence. When you, this seems like such a simple skill, but it can take a long time, especially if you, like me, had lots of experiences, good and bad, but a lot of bad experiences to do with drugs and violence. Um, and for years I couldn't sleep, I didn't sleep for years. 
And I mean, I don't, I don't mean like not well, I mean I didn't sleep. And that will affect you. Lack of sleep will, will put you on your knees over time. It will ruin you. It'll ruin your health, it'll ruin your mind. When you meditate on a regular basis, lots of things are going to happen. I'll start with the basics. So when you meditate, one of the first things you'll notice is you'll start to sleep better because when your mind's still and quiet, you, you sort of turn your mind off in effect. It does, it's wonderfully beneficial in the morning because if you meditate in the morning, you go into your day, you float into the beginning of your day. You know, you can press the reset button before you start your day and then you bang your toe and you're back to square one again. But you can, this, it takes time, it's practice. If you meditate at night and you start to sleep better because you quiet your mind, what will happen is just from sleeping better, from nothing else, not covered, not even touched anything else yet, just from gaining more sleep, your immune system will be stronger. Your body will heal, repair and grow faster. You will have more energy. You will be able to concentrate for longer. You will be more creative. You will be nicer to be around. You will be happier because you'll feel good. And this just comes from sleep, nothing else, just sleep. When you haven't slept well for a long time, now the human race, what you've got to understand is what we do is we bypass the system. So even if you don't actually have a sleep problem, what we do, we go through life, we completely ignore what our body's telling us, oh, we're sugar, caffeine, sugar, caffeine. We're jacked up on stimulants all the time. If everybody in this room stopped having sugar and caffeine tomorrow, within 48 hours, we'd all be falling asleep all over the place. You'd just be nodding off. You know when you wake up in the morning, if you haven't had a cup of coffee, some people, you can't get going. You know, we need stimulants. Because our body, this, Quite basic, but our body's saying, go to sleep, you're tired. And we're going, no chance, I've got stuff to do. And we're having a cup of coffee. So you can, we bypass the system. We override the system. We don't listen to what our body's telling us. And there's a reason our body's giving us these signals. And if you override that system for a certain period of time, you will become ill, right? That's when you get colds. That's when you're exhausted. That's when you don't feel good. That's when you have lots of problems, that's maybe when you don't sleep so good. You'll find a lot of people, if they're about to go on holiday, you'll change down gears, you're in fifth gear all the time, you'll go down your fourth gear, third gear, and it's like the Friday, I'm about to, we're going away on the Saturday, and you get, you come ill, right? Because you've given your chance, you come down, you slow down, you go down gears, and you give your body chance, he has a little saying, it says, right, you'll listen to me now, I'm gonna make you ill. And so a lot of people, just when they're about to go on holiday, they'll go away and become ill. And they get flu and colds and things like this. So the human race, we're, we're all knackered, right? We're all tired and we don't, we don't listen to our bodies. When you meditate, you become aware of the subtle sensations in your body. You become aware of your digestive tract, really aware of your digestive system. Trust me, when you meditate and you feel good, and you've got any peace, you will not want to go and get a double cheeseburger and put it in your body, right? That, that'll, that'll change. You become aware of the subtle sensations of your body. Your body then starts to tell you what's good for you and what's not good for you. It's always trying to do it, we just don't listen. When you become aware of the subtle sensations of your body, you also become aware of the subtle sensations of other people's energy. Now these are the people, for a long time, when you we do things out of obligation, we associate with people, and the influence, and quite often it can be family members as well, it's, you know, it's not just friends, but we go through life and we tolerate a lot of things. Now when you start to meditate on a regular basis, you will become aware of the people that make you feel good, and the people that are manipulating you, and possibly pushing you around. Right? You become aware of other people's energies too. Now, other people might need your help. It doesn't mean you're shutting everybody out. There's a difference between somebody that's asking for help and somebody that's manipulating you. A very big difference. But you become aware of the external energies as well. 
Now you might think that you, what do you do about that? When you start to meditate, you emit a frequency. If you are feeling peaceful inside, that is what you emit. You give that out to everybody you meet. You become, if I'm smiling all the time and I'm nice and nothing's too much trouble and I feel good, I'm gonna make you feel good. World peace starts with here. It's not gonna try and change everybody else outside. If everybody learned to meditate and became peaceful and all they had to do to create world peace, there's only one job we've got. It's to fix this, it's yourself. One, that's only well, got one job, it's you. Not trying to fix everybody else. If everybody learned to meditate and become peaceful, when you become peaceful, you experience joy and bless, you give that out to everybody else you meet. That's how world peace begins. So you become aware of the subtle sensations in your body, you become aware of the external energies as well outside. <sighs> You also then become aware of your thought processes and this is where the meditation's got to come first because only then do you gain perspective and clarity. But then you become aware of your thought processes. For example, I'll give you a couple of little examples. So, what's the difference between excitement and anxiety? Right? Excitement and anxiety, it's, it's you. It's the person in the middle, right? Two people can have a different experience from the same external event. Anxiety is your thoughts about a future event that you cannot control. Excitement is a th your thoughts about a future event that you cannot control. They are the same thing. The difference is the inner emotional state of the person in the middle. What's the difference between paranoia and synchronicity and alignment, right? The ball, the series of coincidences, one after the other, that are unexplained. The ball's the same. The difference is when you don't feel good, you start to think everybody's out to get you. When you feel good, you think God's got your back. You think you're floating around and everything's just di divinities involved. The difference between almost every negative emotional state and thought pattern and the positive is simply the person in the middle. Once you learn to meditate and become peaceful first, then you have perspective and you can start to address your thought patterns. You, you can literally start to reprogram the way you think. Anxiety, stress, anger, frustration, these, these are not compulsory. You can change them all. I'm, I'm telling you, it's a bold statement, but you can fix all of them, right? Because you create all of them. You can do this through meditation. So I'm conscious of time now, so what we're going to do, I'm going to tell you a little bit about meditation and we're going to meditate and then I'll talk a little bit more and then we'll have some, uh, some questions at the end. So meditation, if I was teaching you meditation, you'll have to excuse me, but what I've had to do today is I've had to do abridged versions of everything. So it's actually a lot harder than talking for hours and hours and hours because I've had to just try and pick some relevant points. So I'm just floating around a bit. When I teach meditation normally, what I do is I teach the preliminaries. There's different kinds of meditation. Once you've done preliminaries, you can move on to what they call placement meditation. I've also done transcendental meditation, um, which involves the use of a mantra that you use internally. With Buddhist meditation, what you're doing is you may have done meditation before and you've done there's lots of different kinds of meditation. A lot of people use guided meditation, and that's great. I'm not negating any kind of meditation. It's all beneficial. But a lot of people will put, say, they'll put some music on, and somebody will talk to them, and you lie in your bed, and you relax. Wonderful. But you're not training your mind. What you're doing is you're giving somebody else the power to give you that meditation, which is fine. Uh, and that you have the music and somebody else speaking. With Buddhist meditation, what we're trying to do is, instead of you being a passenger in the vehicle, you become the driver of the car. So all meditation starts with guided meditation initially because you have to be taught those skills and techniques. But beyond that, once you've got the skills and techniques with Buddhist meditation, you do it on your own. You can do it in a group, but the idea is that it's not guided. Meditation is a very personal journey. Two or three weeks in, somebody can come back to me and say, I'm seeing bright colors and bright lights and I'm doing this. Somebody else will have a totally different experience. 
So meditation is a very personal journey. When we meditate, you'd learn the preliminary meditation. The first one would be concentration, which is bringing your attention in onto the breath. Uh, this is the most basic form of meditation and it's used all over the world. It's used in martial arts, yoga and other disciplines too. It's also when you use the breath. I do sport and if I do a run or a swim or a cycle, once I get my first hour out of the way and I'm into it, my attention comes back to the breath. So endurance sport can be meditative too that can you can have the same experience there's lots of ways to find inner peace the reason i focus on meditation you can you can be in nature you can do sport there's lots of things to do art is a wonderful one it's different for everybody but meditation works for everybody now i've had people come back so it didn't work for me and then i ask them questions and i say so have you meditated every day and they're like, yeah, yeah 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 i said did you meditate this morning went, well no not this morning I didn't have time this morning, but I did, I did it yesterday. All right, well, and did you do it on Tuesday? Well, I did the morning one, but not the after. And you find out they've not meditated. Now, this is really important. Meditation can be cumulative or it can be reactive. It's very beneficial to meditate if something happens in the external world and you can stress, you can meditate and you can reduce your stress. Brilliant. You will not find inner peace from this. This is simply reducing your stress. To develop inner peace, Instead of being highly stressed, imagine this is zero. Reactive meditation, you'll be highly stressed and you can reduce your stress. But you're always in this stressed area. If you develop a regular meditation practice, you meditate every morning, every night, what happens is you develop inner peace. It's very different. As you meditate, you become more peaceful. And then when stress, when external events you have a response to an external event, you become less peaceful. You're in this range. So you're either spending a life in peace or a life in stress. The difference is cumulative meditation where you gain momentum and develop inner peace. To do this, you need to meditate every morning and every night. Now life's not perfect and there may be times where you can't. So like I said, but your intention has to be, you've got to make that time. Now, some people say, I've got to get up early. I've got to go to bed later. That may be so, but the quality of the sleep you get will be miles better. Instead of having eight hours where you're tossing and turning, you might have seven and a half hours where you sleep like a baby. A good way, if you intend to meditate and you do it, and you think, I'll do it in the morning, and then it gets to nine o'clock, I've not got time, I'll do it at lunch. Then lunch comes, tea time, and it gets to the evening, you think, oh, I've not time, I'll do it just before I go to bed, and then you're knackered and you don't do it. What you need to do is it needs to be regimented. It needs to be integral into your daily routine. So when you meditate, you need to attach it to something. Now, for me, this is what I tell everybody in my workshops, you attach it to cleaning your teeth, right? I, it's not a conscious decision. When I get up in the morning, I clean my teeth. When I go to bed at night, I clean my teeth. When I clean my teeth, just before or after, I meditate. That's how it's got to be for it to work. For you to get maximum benefit out of this, for, you, for it to change your life, between seven and 14 days doing this practice, for it to change your life, that's what you've got to do. You've got to decide what you want. Remember, it's dead easy. It just requires discipline, effort, and dedication. The meditation that we'll do tonight, we'll do the concentration meditation, which is the most basic meditation, it's focused on the breath. We also do visualization, where you use the mind to imagine stress leaving the body. We also do observation, also known as mindfulness, where you learn to observe your own thoughts. It sounds complicated, but it's actually, it works really well. If, if I'm here and you're over there, and I'm looking at you, then I know you're not me. So just by the act of observation, you create separation. So if you have an angry thought, and you sit back, and you, you're peaceful, and you look at it and you think, actually, I'm not angry, it's just an angry thought. You realize that 
you don't have to be immersed in some of the negative thoughts and emotions that you have in your body. You can create separation and distance, and you can actually not pick them up, right? You can just learn to recognize them and think, whew, thank God, I nearly picked that one up, but I'm not gonna pick that one up. Concentration, visualization, observation, and vocalization, which is mantra. Now, when you use mantra, Transcendental meditation use mantra internally. Buddhist meditation is generally using mantra externally. Uh, so you'll be chanting. Again, we do this in the workshops, but we don't use this till the end of the workshop. Because at the beginning, remember what I said about transcending fear and following your dharma? At the beginning, everybody's thinking, I'm not doing that. Oh, but somebody listens to it, they'll think I sound silly. At the end, everybody's chanting away and nobody cares. It's beautiful. So, the different kinds of meditation, yeah. And we've got concentration. So, some key points about meditation. Number one, these are important. So, a couple of them are critical. If you don't get these, then it won't work. Number one, it's not making it worse. So, when you meditate, initially, because you're becoming quiet and you have contrast and perspective, you might think that when you're meditating, that it's not helping, my mind's like gone a lot worse. No, what it is is because for the first time you're actually aware of how busy your mind is. So it's not making it worse. Secondly, you become aware of the subtle sensations in your body. So when you first meditate, you'll find that you're, you'll think, oh, my pants are tight, I need a wee, my shoulder's itchy, my neck's hurting. All those sensations are there. 24 7 they're already there it's just because you've become peaceful inside and you've you've become still you become aware of these subtle sensations so nothing's happened you're not going to have a heart attack there's nothing those sensations are already there these two are the important ones the first one is that it's no bad meditation when you meditate you'll have one day where you meditate and what you'll do you'll bring your attention in focus on your breath and you might be able to sustain it and focus on your breath for brief periods, and it's beautiful. You have what a term, you experience oneness, a satori. You can be chasing it. Oh. You have a satori, a brief glimpse of enlightenment where you experience the oneness of all things and the universe, and you can spend a long time chasing this. Um, another day, you might meditate, and you can't focus on your breath no matter what you do. Right, your mind's too busy. Examples of this, uh, you can drive to work in a car and when you get there, you sometimes can't remember the journey because your mind's that busy. You can't, you know, your, your attention, your focus, your mind, you're never even in the car for the whole journey. Your mind's somewhere else. Uh, and you could also try to make a cup of tea, boil the kettle and then start talking and go up oh, and boil the kettle. And I know somebody that's done this used to boil the kettle 20 times, I couldn't make a cup of tea, they were like a goldfish. Couldn't literally focus on anything because the mind's so busy. So. So subtle sensations of the body and there are no bad meditations yet. So you'll have a busy mind sometimes and you'll think this is a terrible meditation. It's really important not to judge your meditation. There are no bad meditations quite often when you have a meditation and you feel like it's not going well. That's when you need it the most. That's when it's most beneficial. So don't think that on those days it's a bad meditation. It's not. There are no bad meditations. Don't judge it. And finally, the most important thing when you meditate is not to get frustrated. When you meditate, what will happen? You'll try and focus on your breath. Your mind's going to wander. Yeah, it's going to go over here. This is part of the process. In order to become a successful meditator, you have to go through this. And it doesn't mean it'll, it'll pass forever. You'll have good days and bad days where you, your mind's busy, your mind's not busy. I wouldn't call it a bad day, just when your mind's busy. Your mind's gonna wander, and then once you realize your mind's wander, you gradually bring your attention back to the breath. In this process, you must not get frustrated. 
each time this happens, every time this happens, you've just taken another step down the road to becoming a successful meditator. It is part of the process. It's the road you must travel. When your mind wanders and you bring your attention back to the breath, each time this happens and you practice, this time will reduce, it will get easier. But no frustration. If you're like, oh God, I can't believe it, I'm not concentrating on it. As soon as frustration, as soon as you put resistance into that equation, your meditation won't be effective, right? No resistance in the system, no tension in the system, you've got to take that away. I've done it where I've been meditating before and you can be three or four minutes in and my mind has wandered. And you start off meditating, I'm focused on my breath. And then I'll think, right, okay. Oh, yeah, I've got to see my mum later. Oh, no, I've run out of bananas. Uh, no fuel in the car. Um, oh, yeah, I must remember when I'm writing that, uh, writing that, uh, essay I'm writing for that magazine, I must remember to add this bit in and boom, 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 boom. I can be, you can be five, six, seven minutes into the meditation and completely forgot you're meditating, your mind's that busy. This is part of the process, so accept everything, surrender to the process, no resistance whatsoever. This is, this is how meditation's going to work. So, we're going to meditate. When we do a Buddhist meditation, what happens is you learn how to train the mind. So rather than being a passenger in the vehicle, you've got to learn how to drive the vehicle. Through even just this simple breathing meditation on a repetitive basis, experiencing inner peace and developing inner peace on a daily basis over a sustained period of seven to 14 days, you will notice everything in your life gets easier. You will notice you'll start to feel good. You will notice every aspect of your life improves. What have you got to lose? Try it. For the Buddhist meditation, you put your feet flat on the floor. And you're going to put your right hand and your left hand. Now these are guidelines. So they're not compulsory. It's, a, it's the preferred technique. But if you're not comfortable, just do whatever's comfortable. It's all fine. You're going to sit with your back upright, but not straining. This, this can take quite a bit of practice because I slouch and there's lots of terms you can use, inner wind, inner winds, your energies, chakras, whatever. But when you're meditating, you need to allow energies to flow around your body. And the Buddhist term would be your inner winds, or it could be your chi, it could be whatever you like. So if you strain, you're not relaxed, but if you slouch too much, then your energy is not going to flow, you're not going to breathe correctly. So it's finding this place in the middle, it takes, took me ages to find it, but you will find it. Okay. So your feet flat on the floor, right hand and your left hand. Try and sit upright but not straining. And gently close your eyes. And to start, we're just going to take three deep breaths. And as long as you don't have any breathing problems, you're going to use your nose. So it's three deep breaths in through your nose, and three deep breaths out through your nose. you've got a really heavy rucksack on. Now this rucksack is full of all your thoughts about everything you did today, your journey here, what you had for tea, and everything you're doing later and tomorrow. And this rucksack's really heavy, and you're going to take it off and put it on the floor and leave it outside the room. And for the next 10 minutes or so, you're going to bring your attention inwards into this room and become fully present and in this moment. Now keep bringing your attention inwards 
and now bring your attention into the body. And just become aware of the sensation of your feet on the floor. And your bum and your legs on the seat. And just release any tension at your shoulders and neck. Just wriggle them around if you like. And then keep bringing your attention inwards. And now start to bring your attention inside and focus on the sensation of your breath. Breathing in and out through your nose, breathing cooler in through your nose and warmer out through your nose. Now don't try and control your breath, fast or slow, deep or shallow, doesn't matter, just observe the breath. Breathing cooler in through the nose and warmer out through the nose. Now if your mind should start to wander and you have any distracting thoughts, just accept this. Remember you're learning how to meditate. This is part of the process. Each time this happens, you're moving further down the road to becoming a successful meditator. So no frustration here. Just accept this and then gradually bring your attention back inwards and focus on the sensation of your breath. Breathing cooler in through the nose and warmer out through the nose. Cooler in through the nose and warmer out through the nose. Again, if the mind should start to wander, you have any distracting thoughts. Just accept this, no frustration here. This is a good thing, it's part of the process. And just gradually in your own time, bring your attention back inwards and focus on the sensation of your breath. Breathing cooler in through the nose and warmer out through the nose.
And after a while you start to feel more peaceful, relaxed and calm. Now this space you've created, this special place inside, you can visit here any time you want. This is your space, your place. And if you go through your day and you do start to feel stressed or anxious or agitated or angry, at any time you can just focus on the sensation of your breath, gradually bring your attention back inwards and return to this calm, peaceful, relaxed and happy place. And with practice, you'll learn how to develop this peace, this calm, and then take this out of your meditation and into your day. And go through your day giving this out to everybody you meet. Now breathing cooler in through your nose and warmer out through your nose. And then gradually start to bring your attention outward slowly. And at first bring your attention back into your body. Become aware of the sensation of your feet on the floor. And your bum and your legs on the seat. And your shoulders and neck. Just release your attention and wiggle around if you like. And still keeping your eyes closed. Bring your attention out further. Gradually bringing your attention back out into this room. And now when you're ready, in your own time, gradually opening your eyes. Okay everybody, I'm just going to uh, finish up with a couple of things if I can, and then we'll do some questions if there are any at the end. Yeah. If any of you don't know, I have a radio show, and it's every Monday night at seven o'clock on Salford City Radio. And it doesn't matter if you can't pick it up with the FM 94.4 FM, because I can't even get it. I'm in Bolton, it only really covers Manchester. But what you can do is just go onto the website and you can listen to them again. So there's a uh, like a podcast feature, you can just listen to the shows afterwards. And I've had some really interesting people on, including Willow over there, and also Janet G's been on recently. I've, I've had a number of people on. People that have seen the world a little bit differently than maybe you and I, people that have got an interesting story to tell. And it's very spiritually orientated, the show. Uh, but I've also recently had a friend of mine on who's a, an ex special forces guy talking about adjusting, coming back into society and some of the problems he's faced. Uh, it's a very open and honest show. So I think I say in the book, in order to in order to fix anything, we have to talk about everything. We can't deal with a problem if we don't have all the information. We've got to learn to start talking, connecting and communicating. I've also got a book out, which you know about, but I've, I've got another book that'll be coming out probably in March as well. I'm writing seven, I've written three now, and it's all about, the first book is From Pills to Peace, and it's about initially what the world's like, my journey to this point, and learning how to meditate. The second book, Moving Forward, Learning How to Glide, is about, so now we've got inner peace or developed some level of peace, then we're going to start addressing thought processes and conditioning and changing that. And then the third book, we're moving on to the evolution of consciousness and world peace and uh, many other things as well. I've also, I do workshops where I teach people to meditate. I do one-on-one -on -one sessions as well. Um, not as many of those now, but um, I've got a workshop coming up in January, it's on the 12th of January, it's in a place called Z Arts, which is a, like a theatre in Manchester, and it seats 200 and 
50 people, I think, so it's a big affair. And if anything I've said today has resonated with you, I'd love you to come because I think I can make a difference. I think I can help a lot of people. That's my primary motivation. There are two ways you can go through life. And you, some people pursue money and they end up, you're doomed to misery because you might make some money, but you'll never enjoy what you do. The other way is to follow your heart and your dharma, to do what you love. And then you never work another day in your life. Everything you do, you do with passion. You're not worried about what time you finish, what time you start, you do it because you love it. And when you love what you do, you'll be surprised you'll become very good at it. And then when you become very good at it, usually you get paid at the end as well. So one's winging it, the other way is following the money. Don't follow the money, follow your heart. The money will come if it's meant to, and maybe you don't need the money. I don't know. Um, yeah, so shalom. Thank you all for coming. And if you have any questions, and I think I've done really well there for time, because that's uh, what I was aiming for. What's, what's your strength? What's your strength um, tattoo with the darkness strength tattoo? Did you have it before you, when you was a thug or did you have it later? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was a thug. Uh, but even though I was a thug, I'll, I'll do something. Now, don't be weirded out. I just want to do something, right? So I'm just going to move away from the mat. Look at the tattoos on my back and I'll tell you about them. Look at this. Can you see? Yeah, so. We didn't get them really. We didn't get them. You weren't meant to read them. I was just illustrating the point that I have many, many tattoos on my body. Um, I didn't realise, but all this time, I've been, I've been writing anyway. I just didn't write it in a book. I, I've always had a lot to say, and I've always been excited by the mind. It's the only thing that really excites me is the oh, mind. Oh, the victims on the back there. Your, your victims. No, no, no. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're all quotes from people who... Um, <laughs> the quotes about the mind, all quotes about the mind. And even before I had my nervous breakdown, I went down a spiritual path, which probably saved my life. There's no two ways about that. Um, I was... You could see there's this internal, tr internal struggle going on because on one hand, I was portrayed, I was externally, I was a party guy, I took a lot of drugs, hung around with doormen and bad people maybe, and I was violent. But on the other hand, um, I was crying out to the, there was something more and I, I was trying to find it, you know. This tattoo, Out of the Darkness Comes Great Strength, was, I call tattoos external emotional scars. What you do, you don't wake up on a Monday and you think, I'll go get a tattoo. Usually what happens is something significant happens in your life. It might be a bereavement, it might be the birth of a child, it might be a traumatic event that you come through, whatever. And then what happens is that's when you get a tattoo. And for me, every tattoo on my body has a significant emotional uh, meaning, you know. So that was, I went through a traumatic event and that tattoo afterwards, I realised that I'm still here, I'm still alive. And it made me stronger and I learned from it. That's all it was. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. As far as starting to meditate, how would you sort of, what part of your house, how do you decide what's the best place to start? Okay, this is a good, good question. Um, they're all good questions, by the way. <laughs> um, so, you need a space to meditate in. Now, I have a meditation room I've had for a number of years. Not everybody has that luxury. And I simply decided it was more important than some of the things in my life and emptied one of the rooms out and made it a meditation zone. What you need to do if you create a space for meditating, you need to give yourself every chance possible. So visually, you don't really want to do it in front of your notice board or your desk. You need a peaceful space, you might have a candle. You might have, um, you know, I have a shrine, but you don't need to have a shrine. Um, you need somewhere comfortable to sit, ideally a space where you can sit where you can dim the lights and as, as best possible not be disturbed. It doesn't have to be spiritually significant, but it wants to be a peaceful space, you know, and that quite often as well it helps if you're burning some incense and things like this. What, can you imagine a guy for me who's been a cage fighter, who's been a drug dealer, who's beat people up for money collecting debts and stuff like that, 
and I'm sat in my room with incense burning, thinking, if somebody sees me, what will they think? You know, it was it was a significant change for me to to go through this. So for a long time, I did it in quiet. I didn't tell people about it. I couldn't say I was a Buddhist for over a year because I I couldn't say it out loud. I remember going to the Buddhist centre in Bolton, and what I used to do, I knew all the doormen in Bolton, right? all of them. So what I'd do, I found a route through the back streets I could get to the Buddhist centre without being spotted, and I'd literally be hood up, balaclava on, and shimmy through the streets of Bolton, hoping nobody would see me because they might recognise me and think, what's he doing there? You know, that was because I used to, what swear, but I used to care about what people thought. And now, there's two ways you can go through life. You can try to please other people. You'll never please them. They will control you, and you will be miserable. The other way to go through life is do what you like, right? And it does not a selfish pursuit because remember, in order to help other people, you've got to be happy and peaceful too. Do what you like, do what makes you happy. And then the people that really matter will see how happy you are and they'll be happy for you. They're the people that love you. And the people that aren't happy about it, you don't really want them in your life. Any more? If you're happy and I'm not happy about it, that's not a good relationship, is it? Your joy should bring me joy, you know, if I, if I care about you. Yeah, ideally, it's different in different techniques and traditions. In transcendental meditation, it's 20 minutes, and you do it at different times, actually. Um, in Buddhist meditation, ideally, you want to do it as soon as you wake up, because if you don't catch it then, and you get an hour into your day, you'll be surprised you'll just not catch it, that meditation. You need to make it very early. Uh, same with the nighttime meditation. In Buddhist meditation, 15 minutes, either end, 15 minutes. Um, even with just that one meditation, the idea of doing a workshop is you get four meditations so you have choices, because some meditations work better than others for different people. Remember, it's a personal journey. And you can choose what works for you. But the breathing meditation, just with that one meditation, if you do that for 15 minutes every morning, every night, for 14 days, we could sit back here in 14 days and have a conversation, and you will be telling me about the amazing things that are happening in your life. Can you come and do a laughter yoga? Oh, you've no idea. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't run that workshop. I was just, I was asked, I was at a. Uh, um, well, that's a good point. I don't know. I don't know. It's, I was outside my comfort zone. I might be able to talk in front of people, but doing this laughter yoga took me outside my comfort zone. But. Um, it was one of the best things I've done in a long time. It's brilliant. In my book, I say you have to. You have to try the ten to find the two, right? If you predetermine whether you're going to enjoy something or not before you've tried it, yeah? Especially if it's something you've never done, this is the big thing. You might try ten things. Nine of them you might not like, but one of them you might, but you're never going to find the one if you don't try the ten. You've got to do new stuff all the time. Try new things. Don't become set in your ways. Don't have preconceived ideas. Do new stuff. Get outside your comfort zone. Life will become joyous and blissful in a very short space of time. When you start to meditate on a regular basis, you'll find that you have perspective. You start to feel yourself again. You start to feel good. And then you're very much more open to doing new things and transcending fear. Yeah. Patrick, so in your past, when you've been uh, rubbing shoulders with druggies and gangsters, mm. Uh, do you, and, and you've found this journey, which is about you, yeah. and, and getting yourself in the right place. And you, do you ever feel like you want to be evangelical about it to people you knew in the past who you saw good in, even though they were doing bad things? Do you, do you ever feel like, yes. I, want, I want to get back in touch with them and show them that there's a different way? Do you ever? Yeah, uh, well, I, very poignant that you say that, because a couple of things have happened since originally I went down this road and I didn't tell anybody. Then I started to shout about it. And a lot of people that from my past got in touch with me. Um, and what surprised me, I was dreading this day because I knew this day would come where some people might get in touch with me. The ones that have got in touch with me have changed. They've changed too. I assumed that everybody else would stay the same. They've not. As I say, you get into your 40s, maybe your 50s, but generally in your 40s, 
most people go through some kind of significant shift in their life and they've done it independently of me. They've got back in touch, we've hooked up, and a lot of the people have changed. They've, they've realized that, you know, they've dropped their ego, they've stopped caring about what other people think, and they've found happiness, not necessarily through meditation, but through lots of things, uh, through, through different things. But what I've also done is I've intentionally sourced out, not everybody, because it would take too long, but one or two people that um, maybe I felt I needed to apologize to, you know. Uh, and I have done this, and I'm, I'll, I'll willingly do it because I'm not running anymore, you know what I mean? I, I want to, if somebody, if there is a problem, I, I want to fix it, you know? But I do think that it's about a personal choice, and if somebody doesn't want to change, then there's, they have to arrive at that point. But they don't need to know how to change, they just need to know that maybe they want change. Then, then we can join in and have a conversation. But I find it quite sad, you'll see, some people, there's two types of older people that I encounter, usually, and some are like children again, and they don't care what anybody thinks, and they're daft as a brush, and they're experiencing joy and bliss. Others don't cut the ropes, they don't surrender, they don't let go of the past, in order to experience joy and bliss. You have to become still through meditation. You have to become aware of the things that are holding you back, the thought process about past events, and you have to cut those loose. Then you have to choose which direction you're going to go in using the correct compass to navigate, which is experience joy and bliss and helping other people. And then you move forward in that direction. That's how you experience a joyful life. If somebody isn't ready to make those changes, then there is, there's not a lot anybody can do. They have to arrive at the point of change, you know, the shift um, on their own usually. You know, some people are very lucky. What they can do is go through life, realise they're out of alignment, and before they, anything breaks, they can pull it back. You know, but I wasn't that lucky. I just kept pushing down the road and became very ill. Yeah. I'm not sure if I answered your question. I just veered off and said what I wanted, but I think I think I'll have to do. <laughs> Sorry. Have you noticed uh, in your meditation shots, do you ever get anyone saying that they get really, really cold doing meditation and do you know what causes that? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm from recalling, I've taught a lot of people to meditate, I can only recall one woman that got cold and I think that was because of the eating milk. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what happens with meditation, because it's such a personal journey, the array of experiences I've had, even just from a short workshop, is amazing. You know, every time I do a workshop, there'll be something I've not, an experience that hasn't cropped up before will come. And usually, over a period of time, if, if we still have contact after that and meditate, it becomes apparent um, maybe why their journey is, is how it was. But it, I suppose if, you, if you're getting cold when you're meditating, You've always been cold, right? Remember, when you meditate, you become aware of subtle sensations in your body, so you're probably cold before that and don't realise it. When you meditate and become still, you become very aware of the sensations in your body. And the only other thing I would say is that maybe if the, somebody becomes cold, it's not there beforehand. When they meditate, you know that when you have the... I can't, is it the mammalian response? When you have the blood pump into your body, but when you're immersed in... Uh, certain circumstances like ice water, the blood goes to the essential organs and your extremities become uh, cold because the blood doesn't go there. So I can only assume that possibly when you meditate, um, your body's doing whatever it needs to do and maybe, maybe your heart needs some help, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Great. Do you ever fast? Yes. And what's the longest you've fasted for? Okay. Um, interesting this, my, I like to think, because you can clearly see this divine being in front of you, this, that um, I, I gained, gained a degree of mastery over my body. What I did, which I haven't talked about tonight, about this, this answer is going to take a couple of minutes, is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was, I went, I had a problem with my knees, and I'll get to fasting, it, it does make sense. I had a problem with my knees and I went to have them looked at and the problem got worse and I'd torn my kneecaps, damaged my ligaments, had arthritis in both knees and the knees, they said I needed three operations on each knee and that was that, there was no, there was no option, that was what I was told. 
I didn't listen to what they told me. I completely decided I wasn't accepting this because in having the operation, it meant that I might not be able to walk properly after that. Um, and I started running. And then I started running marathons. And then I started doing triathlon. And then I started doing Ironman. My knees completely healed. There's no arthritis. There's no damaged kneecap. The ligaments aren't damaged. My knees healed, right, when they said that I needed the operations and there was nothing else they could do. You can call that what you want, right? I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully because... Uh, but for me, it was borderlining on a miracle for my knees because if you knew me in my life, for about 18 months, I could barely... I was in agony, I could barely walk. And I decided there was going a different route. I believe that through meditation, I had to gained a degree of mastery over my body. The mind is far more powerful than the physicalities of your body. And I do believe that this is an incredible healing machine and given the right circumstances and environment, amazing things can happen. Have I fasted? Yeah, I've fasted many times. And what I learned is I took my body weight. I was on steroids and I was a bodybuilder, a bit of a thug, and I was about 15 and a half stone, but I was built like a tank. There was, um, a big guy. Not fat either, you know, I was a big guy. And then once I learned to meditate, my body weight started coming down. And obviously I stopped taking steroids and then I stopped eating and putting as much junk in my body. And then I decided that I wanted to get my weight down to ten and a half stone. So that's what I did. I simply became very aware of what I put in my body. And I got my weight right down to ten and a half stone and then I went down to having one meal a day, which was normal, but it was, it was I was only eating really healthy food, you know, natural ingredients. Um, I then went for, I could go for several days without eating. I've never done an elongated fast. I've never done a week, two weeks, anything like that. I say in my book that the mind is far more important than food and that this might seem crazy, but you can go easily go three or four days without eating food and you'll be fine, right? If your mind isn't working correctly, you might not even see the sunset. You might not even make it through the day. This is where people become, experience despair, become too so unhappy, depressed and take their own life. And I had a, it's very sad, I had a girl promoting, when the book first came out, I had some celebrities promoting this book. And one of the girls was called uh, Sophie Graddon, who was about to promote this book and she took her own life two days before she was going to launch this book herself. And the whole time she was, this girl was suffering, um, suicidal, and we, we didn't know because she didn't talk, because she didn't express how she was feeling inside. So the mind is far more important than the body. The body can withstand a lot, and you'll find that I fasted for a few days, no more. If you put the right stuff in your body, you can drastically reduce your food intake. If you're getting correct rest and sleep, you can drastically reduce your food intake. We all eat way more than we need to, and we're constantly putting toxins and poison in our body. As a nation, we're killing ourselves. We're doing it every day. We're just putting junk in. And I'm not perfect. My life is far from perfect. Recently, because of circumstances, I've, I've been working 19 hour days for three months straight, seven days a week. And I then my diet veered off and I started eating junk. So at that point, I had to make a decision, prioritise things. But when I'm peaceful inside, when I'm calm, and when I'm in a, a good place, I, I have a lot of mastery over this body. And I could, I, I've never attempted it. I imagine I could fast for quite a long time. But um, yeah, I didn't. I wouldn't say I fasted for long periods, but I did get. I was having one meal a day for a long, long periods, and my body weight dropped, and I was super healthy. And my times where I was running, swimming, you'd expect them to go down because of, you know, but actually, because my body weight went down, I, would, I mean, as a triathlete, you do not want to have fat on your body, it's a disadvantage, so I just shed all the fat on my body, you know. Again, probably not the answer to the question you asked. <laughs> Thank you very much, Patrick, very inspirational talk. Thanks, thanks very much. I was impressed with that and how you bounced back from the, well, the bottom room. Really. Mm. Yeah, uh, hats off to you, mate. Well done. Thank you. Thanks very much.